Hi everyone, my name is Kendall Henry. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Public Art at the Department of Cultural Affairs here in New York City. You're about to watch an interview with two of our current peer artists or public artists in residence, conducted by Chief of Staff Shirley Levy, who manages this amazing program. The artists are Sophia Dawson, a painter who incorporates social activism and community engagement in her work, who's working with the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. You'll also hear from Andre Wagner, an incredible photographer, also trained as a social worker, and who, who's working with the Commission on Human Rights on a number of projects. For background, the PEAR program was inspired by the work of Meryl Latiman Eucalese, a brilliant artist who pioneered the municipal arts, artist residency in the 1970s, when she began working with the Department of Sanitation here in New York. In 2015, this agency expanded the program and began placing artists in other city agencies including the two you're about to watch. You'll see what Sophia and Andre has been up to and the plans for the remainder of the residency. Thank you for watching and enjoy. Hi everyone and welcome. My name is Shirley Levy. I'm the Chief of Staff of the Department of Cultural Affairs. So excited to be in conversation with two of our public artists in residence here today, uh, public artists in residence being PEAR. Um, I've got Andre Wagner here. Uh, he is uh, currently embedded within the Commission on Human Rights and Sophia Dawson with the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. Uh, we are so excited to talk with you both. Um, this is, I think, a, an interesting moment in the residency uh, life, uh, life cycle, I should say, because we've passed through research phase and now we're deep in the middle of implementation. So your projects are sort of fully baked or humming along. And I think we'd love to hear from you both about how your projects have evolved um, from where they maybe started conceptually, where they are now and, and how things are going. So I guess perhaps we'll start with you, Andre, if you don't mind sharing a little bit. Uh, tell us about what attracted you to PEAR, uh, you know, what compelled you to apply for PEAR in the first place and kind of what your experience has been like with the commission. Yeah, I mean, well, before I started photographing, I actually studied uh, social work and um, that's a big part of, I think, just like my thinking and framework as a photographer that shaped a lot of just how I, I go about my work. And, you know, once I found out about the Commission on Human Rights Artists and Residents Program, I just thought it was like, you know, a great way to pair my work, you know, directly with the city and with human rights. Honestly, the pair program really felt like the first time that I saw an institution um, really backing the kind of work that I've been doing in my practice for the past like 11 years. Um, I didn't know that, you know, I started most of the work that I've done specifically work, you know, serving different communities, working with political prisoners, working with moms, working with exonerated five. It was more so like, okay, there would be a pricking in my spirit and God would be like, do this, this, and this, and I would go and do it. And then somehow, some way, art would come out of that. Uh, but it was much more about figuring out how to use my gift to serve others. So I've been doing that for a while, but without any type of backing, um, institutional backing or financial backing. And with PEAR, I didn't have to do that. I just was like, I just submitted to what, what already is important to me. But usually you're really trying to make your work fit what they're trying to do. Um, so PEAR just felt like a really good fit. I, um, I'm just that your response is just so overwhelmingly joyful for me because we, we really try so hard to create a space where artists can come in with their own practice and not be prescriptive about the kind of work that you have to produce. Um, and that can be very stressful or complicated as a concept for city workers to understand, right? We have a budget cycle we have to comply with. We have rules about procurement, et cetera. And this is a very small project where we kind of try to break through some of those molds and say, no, we're here to work with artists. Artists will lead us, you know, will show us the way we have to be patient and kind of let things be. Um, and then the, and the work will evolve from that space, from within that space. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm glad to hear that you feel that. I'd love to hear from you both about, you know, sort of what the concept was originally for the project once you arrived at your respective agencies and then how that project evolved over time, if it did, if you can just share a little bit about the progression of your project to, until today. I mean, I think 
you know, when I first started trying to wrap my head around the project, I think it was also just complicated because COVID was still yeah. kind of new um, and the pandemic. And, um, you know, with my practice as being a photographer, I work a lot as a street photography, like everything pretty much changed for me. You know, it hasn't necessarily always been easy. It's been really stressful. It's been hard, you know, trying to take care of my own like personal health and well-being on top of that. But I think kind of going back to what I originally wanted, why I wanted to be part of Pair in the first place is because I felt like, you know, I'm, I have a gift of photography of sight. Um, I have a platform and to be able to, to work with Pair to kind of shed a light on this moment and to kind of be a witness. Um, and it's also been really collaborative with, um, with the Commission on Human Rights too, because, you know, it's been a lot of conversations and I've been getting a lot of help with my projects. Um, one of the ones that I've been doing is uh, featuring black owned businesses. And, and that idea kind of really came out, um, came during the height of the pandemic. You know, we're thinking about, you know, who are essential workers? Um, what do black owned businesses mean in the communities that they serve? Um, what kind of space are they? Um, and that, you know, that, that yeah, that just kind of came out of the events that we're dealing with. Um, and then I also thought it was a great opportunity to, you know, spread my wings in other as in other communities that I necessarily haven't worked with or don't have direct ties with. So I've been in a sick community, you know, photographing in Gurwarwas, um, photographed the family, you know, inside of their home for a whole evening. Um, and just using, yeah, using that opportunity to to be in different spaces um and to just like hopefully, you know, come out with imagery and messages that continue to unite us as a people. There's so much division right now. There's so much um, just, I think, uh, a lot of pain that's happening in a lot of communities. Um, and then another part of one of my projects is I've been working with Neighbors Together, um, which is an organization that Commission on Human Rights already works with. Um, and they work a lot with the, the homeless population. And so early on, it was like, you know, in the pandemic, they were saying everybody stay at home. And it's like, okay, well, if you're homeless, you can't stay at home. So, you know, I went out photographing um, a peaceful protest, like at Hudson Yards, or just trying to raise awareness about, you know, homelessness and homeless rights, about the vouchers that, you know, New York City offers to people, but then also just the difficulties of having a housing voucher and still trying to get fair housing. So there's such a stigma around homelessness. And I just remember, you know, one of the first people I photographed, this guy named Charles, and you know, he's just kind of telling me about his story about him growing up in New Jersey um, and, you know, being able to get housing, how he's able to continue to, to go to school. And I think he's like studying like counseling and divinity. And I'm just thinking about like how much he's like adding to our society um, and how much, you know, just how like a little bit of support and stability continues to give him the, the, the courage or the aspiration to go forward and, and pursue his dreams and things like that, you know. I have so much to respond to, but I'm going to let Sophia, <laughs> Sophia speak first. I have a lot to respond to too. And I'm trying to figure <laughs> out if there's a way in all that you're doing to overlap. Because mm. it would be so cool um, to, to collaborate in that way. I don't know anything about photography. I mean, my paintings are all photo-based, but that's about it. Like that <laughs> ends right there. But the project that we're doing um, does have a photography component. We just like literally two weeks ago, based on how big I want to print these photos, learned that like, yeah, I can't just tell the kids to go home and take the picture on their phone. And so I'm working with Mock J right now. They're saying they have someone that they were going to hire. But I'm like, hmm, I wonder if in all that you're doing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, let me um, know if there's a way I can help or we could collaborate, you know. Yeah, that would be cool. They, I mean, they're, they're already talking about like hiring someone else to do it. I don't see why we couldn't just work with someone who's already with Pear. Um, I mean, we probably need more than one person. So when I came into this project, I was really just thinking about, didn't we have to like pick a neighborhood that we wanted to work with? I don't really remember what happened. I remember in the beginning, because Mock J is everywhere. So the mayor's office of criminal justice is huge. And they have two components. They have like the, um, the anti-gun violence and then they have um, folks who do more work in the community and they're in every borough and every housing, all that stuff. So it was when, when we were thinking about maybe we would meet in person, that's probably what the conversation was. 
they were like, oh, what borough, what area would you like to work with? So I grew up in East New York, kind of where East New York, Flatbush and Brownsville meet. And so I was leaning towards those communities. And um, I really just wanted to deal with a lot of the stigma around living in those neighborhoods, um, how those neighborhoods are portrayed on in media, which, you know, over time I learned is strategic because it's still like, those are like the cheapest areas to live in Brooklyn. So if we criminalize them and do all this stuff, it kind of somehow works out for those people that are coming in and buying. Um, but for me, you know, I was always frustrated with how, especially like, for example, when a Kai girly was killed um, by police officers in the pink houses, pink houses is like walking distance from my house. And I just, I mean, granted, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that does go down. I just personally have lived, before I moved to Manhattan in February, I've lived in those areas and I've never, like as a grown 33 year old woman, I've still never seen not even a fight up close. And so for my neighbor to always be like plagued as like, you know, there's nothing here but people that are walking around with guns and shooting, that really disturbed me. Um, and so that's something I wanted to deal with. I wanted to have people in the community share their stories of resilience, um, specifically around any social justice issues. So that way, you know, we could basically take ownership of our own narratives. That, that was my original goal. And then some point between the beginning of the pandemic to where we're at now, up until a few weeks ago, um, I think I was actually preparing a Bible study for church um, because I have had COVID twice and survived mm -hmm. by God's grace. And I know a lot of people that have, have a similar testimony. And so it changed, the project changed from like just narratives of resilience to like, I mean, it's called the new name of the project is Testify. And I've asked the young people. So I'm working with 53 young people in the youth council um, the first my like the first half of the semester, I've just been like basically pulling them through my process, how to make a portrait, all this stuff. It's like a lot of technical artsy stuff. And then the second half is this project testify. And so now it shifted to it's like, okay, go into your community, your block, your neighborhood, your building, your own apartment. Even you can use yourself as a subject and just find someone who has a testimony. And I was explaining that there's no big or small testimony. Like the testimony could be that I woke up with a smile on my face. That's literally a testimony in 2020. Um, some people are survivors um, from COVID. Some people have survived gun violence. Some mothers have lost their kids and somehow found ways to, to make peace with the mother of the child that took their child's life. Like I know that within the community, there are like all these things that happen that may not be the norm. And I'm just curious to see what they pick because I just left it at that. I was like, pick someone with a testimony. We're even talking about maybe coming back in sooner um, to think about installing this work, creating an online platform where the testimonies could live, figuring out how regular people can upload their testimonies to the platform and it could become a thing. So that's, that's where I'm at. But, I, but yeah, if there's time and space and they have the money to pay you, I would love to um, work with you in that capacity. I love the um, the idea of what you were saying about just having it like kind of like living online and stuff, because that's something I've been thinking about throughout my residency as well. And something I, I was proposing to people um, at the commission is that like, I would love for there to be um, like some type of online permanent collection of this work of this time. It'd be so great for people to be able to access this work, you know, even years from now to, to look back and see like, what were the artists talking about right now? What was the work that was happening? Who were they collaborating with and stuff like that? Andre, Sophia, is there anything else that you want, that you want to share? I just feel like, you know, it's, I think it's important to share that um, this was my third time applying to PEAR um, over the past few years, and I'm very grateful to have received the opportunity. Yeah, I, I think to piggyback off of that, this is my first time actually receiving the Artist in Residency program. I oh, think. Oh, that's uh, cool, Andre. <laughs> yeah, I don't Won't know. Won't be I've the last, I'm sure. <laughs> well, you know, I feel like, you know, my, my schooling and training is in social work. And, you know, I came to New York and fell in love with art and photography. And I feel like I've 
it's been hard just trying to get my footing in places and, and get that kind of support and stuff. So this has been a blessing to me. This program is what it is because of amazing artists like yourselves who just provide a profound new perspective or, you know, your own perspective um, on our work and our times. And uh, I don't know, you help us kind of see things in a new way. I mean, I'm using that in the most kind of literal and simplistic term, but uh, we need you in government. And I'm just really grateful for you being here as part of the program. Thank you.